Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. We're just going to read a couple verses. I want you to begin reading with me. Verse number 8. The Bible says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whosoever breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whosoever removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and for your loving kindness and for your tender mercy and your excellent greatness. Now, Father, as we come to you tonight, our hearts are full. We've enjoyed the good singing. We've enjoyed the good testimonies. Lord, we could truly leave right now and say it was good to be in the house of God. Lord, we're thankful you are a good God. And that God, you have been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, yet you were without sin. And Lord, you know what we're going through. And God, you know how to direct us. And we sure do bless your holy name. Now, Father, I pray that you'd work with those young children on the other side. Thank you for those folks that give up their Sunday night service to teach those children. And God, I pray that, Lord, those children would grasp and embrace the truth of the Word of God. May they hide it in their heart that they might not sin against Thee. And I pray for those that have not yet reached the age of accountability, that, Lord, when they come to that point, I pray they tr trust Christ at a, as a young age. I thank you for all those youngsters over there that have been saved. What a blessing. And Lord, I pray you would bless them and help them. And then, Father, I do pray for the, our teens that, Lord, you would undergird them with truth. And Lord, as I said a moment ago, they're faced with things we didn't even dream about in, the, in our day. And God, I know that the wicked one has pulled out all the stops. He's trying to do everything he can while he can to damn people to hell. And those that no, God, he wants to, Lord, ruin our testimonies and make us not effective in this world. And so I pray for these teens. I pray you'd help them and certainly put a hedge about them. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, once again. I pray now that you would make it uh, come alive in our lives and in our hearts. And, God, I certainly do pray that it would impact us tonight and throughout all of eternity. Bless now, help your people, get glory to your name, be with every true church assembled tonight, preaching the word of God, bless them abundantly. Father, we'll not fail to give you praise and honor and glory for all things, for it's in the wonderful name of Christ we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, the verses we read hinge on verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, I've seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. And can I say that what uh, Solomon was blessed to pin down to write, inspired to write, he, he says you better be careful how you conduct yourself. There is a consequence. And he said there was a time when those who were rulers rode the horses, but now they're walking. There was a time that those that were their servants who did the walking, now they're riding on the horses. And can I say that you and I better be very careful with the decisions and choices we make uh, because there are consequences. Now notice a few things that he uh, instructs us in in the verses we read. First of all, notice that he deals with those who are ensnared. Verse number 8, he says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Now he's talking about those princes who tried to lay snares, uh, tried to make themselves look better, tried to do away with folks who stood in opposition to them. Uh, they dug pits only to fall in them themselves. And I'm reminded of wicked Haman who uh, thought to destroy Mordecai. And he made the balances and was going to hang him on the balances. Uh, but isn't it amazing how God found him out through in, in, in Esther and in, in, in King Ahasuerus and how Mordecai was the one who got elevated to be the ruler. And now Mordecai's been hung on his own device. 
And can I say there are folks uh, always trying to lay traps? Hmm? Be careful. Your sin will find you out. Hmm? So we find that there is the ensnaring, and make no mistake, the devil's always trying to ensnare us. Uh, notice the eschewing. Look in verse number 8. He said, And whosoever breaketh a hedge, uh, or forsakes the hedge, the eschewing, they forsook it, notice what happens. A serpent shall bite him. What we don't understand under the umbrella of grace that God has hedged us into his protection. And when we put into practice the things that God has hedged us with, the house of God, the word of God, the avenue of prayer, a walking in the spirit, walking by faith, when we put into practice those things in our lives, God's protective hand is upon us. But when we forsake those things, there's a sorry no good serpent out there, and he will bite you. Every young man, young woman thinks they know more than their parents and launch out to tackle this world. They don't get out there very far and they find out how uh, insignificant they are and the world tackles them. There is a serpent who bideth. Can I say one of the saddest commentaries of, of, uh, of our churches is we've all had people who once served God and they've stepped away from the hedge of God and now their life is in ruins. Let me just say this and qualify this. There's nobody in this building or around this building, from this pulpit to the, the stop sign up there and uh, all through Florence and all through the world that is any match for the devil. You think you can handle him, and you're no match for him. Matter of fact, we don't even deal with the devil. Hmm? He just sends one of his little junior imps our way and knocks us off, of course. Are you listening? Uh, I heard a man preach 40 years ago on making hell's top 10 most wanted list. You get on that list, and the devil's, he'll get you, you know, you got his attention. But until then, we're no match for the devil. Notice, if you will, he deals with eroding foundations in verse number 9. Whosoever he moved with stones shall be hurt therewith. Can I say there are some foundations God has set forth? We have the foundation of the Word of God. That's what this church is built on. You start doing away with the Word of God, and friends, you're going to have problems. And it amazes me how many churches in our area you stand true to the Bible, and now they've removed the Bible, and they've got at best a commentary they call the Bible, and what has happened is their churches uh, have begun to erode. And all of a sudden now, they can't keep the crowd, so they've got to remove the light bulbs, and now they have dark sanctuaries. Uh, and now they've got to have uh, smoke machines to make everything uh, emphatic. And now they can no longer enjoy good singing like we had tonight. They've got to have a rock band. Uh, and they constantly are moving the bar closer and closer to the world. Uh, and their philosophy is, if we become like the world, we'll win the world. Uh, no, if you become like the world, you are the world. Uh, 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 why would the world want to come to what they already are? Uh, what it takes to win the world is Christ. Uh, and you'll never exemplify him outside this book. Uh, and he says, you start removing the stones of the foundation, you're going to get hurt thereby. It amazes me how many churches have removed the pulpits, have removed uh, uh, the songbook, have removed the Bible, have removed godly singing, have removed old-time worship. It amazes me how their crowds didn't get bigger. They're dwindling. They're scrambling to see what's next to try and build their churches back up. Uh, my dear friends, those very things they should have been standing on, they have removed. He deals with eroding. He deals also with estrangement. Look in verse number 9. And he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. That word estrangement means to, you know, to have something depart. And he's talking about chopping wood. Now, in this crowd we're in here tonight, I know there's some that know something about chopping wood. I we I'm weird. There's two things I enjoyed as a young man. I enjoyed chopping wood, and I enjoyed working in concrete. I know, it's strange. Brother Ray and I, we loved working in concrete. We could lay some concrete. It's funny, now we can't. Yeah, now we say, God bless them, let them younger men well eat the concrete, but... But I used to love chopping wood. But the Bible deals with when you cleave wood, be careful. You can get hurt with that axe. And I'll tell you when you'll get hurt with the axe. 
when you get real complacent about the axe. When you get to where you think you're handling the axe, all of a sudden you'll hit a knot and that thing will bounce off and it hits you. Mm -hmm. And then he deals with the edgeless in verse number 10. He says, If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the age, then must he put more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. He deals with the edgeless. My dear friends, if you're swinging an axe that doesn't have a good edge on it, that means you're going to have to swing that thing harder than if you kept a good edge on it. He said, you let wisdom direct you, not your brute strength. Because you can only swing that axe so much, and you only get so much work done if, you're, if you don't have the right edge on it. Now, I got to reading that and got to thinking about this the other day, about if the iron be blunt. I got to thinking about people who've lost their edge. There are people that have lost their edge. Used to be folks that, man, they were first to church, last to leave. They was first to testify, first to sing, first to do anything. But tonight they've lost their edge. They're not as excited about the things of God as they want to. One who loses their edge, they become dull. Used to, they was exciting. Tonight they're dull. Hmm? You know why there's some people that don't come around and ask us about the hope that we have in Christ? Because we've gotten dull. They don't see that hope. Hmm? Can I say some who've lost their edge have become dim? Used to, they'd light up a room for Christ. Now they're dim. Now I know about three people in here are going to understand this, but my grandparents had kerosene lanterns. Remember those? Three of us. All right. Uh, it's funny, they put food coloring or something in that kerosene because some of them would look blue and some of them red and some of them green, and they'd light that lamp, and, and it, it, it would be nice for a while. But if you don't take that globe off and clean the soot from that kerosene that burnt, it gets dim. The light's not real bright. And some people get dim because they've got too much soot in their life. They've lost their edge. And then I thought about this. Those who lose their edge, becomes, they become defeated. You know, one of the worst commentaries for a Christian is that you're defeated. Uh, the Bible says, thanks be unto God that giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the Baptist theme songs is victory in Jesus. But there are some Christians who are defeated. Shame, 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 as Gomer Powell used to say, that you're defeated. So I'm reading this the other day in my office, and as I read this, this overwhelming thought came to my heart on verse number 10. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. I want to preach on this little thought. Just got a couple little thoughts about this, but I want to preach on this tonight. Worn out and headed for burnout. Worn out and headed for burnout. Can I say, looking at churches, and you know I'm blessed to go places and preach meetings, and, and uh, you know, there's a common theme. No matter where you go, people are worn out, and a lot of folks who are are doing the work for God or getting burnt out. One man once said years ago that 90% of the work gets done by 10% of the people. And that happens in a lot of churches. Now, thankfully, our church, we got a lot of folks doing a lot of things. But uh, can I say, if you're not careful, you'll get worn out, and then you get burnt out. Now, I know in times gone by that pastors would get up and blast you if you take a vacation. Say, oh, no, you need to be in church all the time. Well, hallelujah, I want to be in church all the time. I love being in church. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus told his disciples after they'd been out ministering and witnessing and doing a work, he told them, come you to a desert place and rest for a little while. If you don't come apart, you will come apart. And I've gotten flack in years gone by by saying, if you need some time off, go to go to." to the mountains or go to the beach or go somewhere just relax with your family for a few days, go do it. Go do it. Relax. Get your mind right. If not, you'll get burnt out. Hmm? Huh? Listen, 
If you get a week or two weeks vacation on your job, by the time vacation rolls around, you're burnt out. You're ready for your vacation. Hmm? Uh, I, I don't know anybody that loves working a job so much that they say, no, I never want any time off. I want to be here all the time. Just keep the coffee flowing, I'll be here. Huh? Yeah. You know what job stands for? Just over broke. The only reason you go every day is because you're just over broke and you need the money. Huh? But if you deal with people long enough and you deal working with the machine or you deal with working a, 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 some faster on the job for long, that thing gets old. What ought to never get old is our Christianity. But if you're not careful, you'll get worn out serving the Lord and you'll end up getting burnt out. Now listen, when I'm talking about being worn out and burnt out, this is not a question of your effort. And thanks be unto God for folks that want to do something for God. And God didn't save us to sit us on a stool and do nothing. You ought to have a desire to do something for God. I was talking to somebody the other day, and listen, I've been preaching. Lord, have mercy, this is going to hurt. <clears throat> going on 40 years, 35th year this year. Now, when I first started preaching, I was absolutely slapped crazy. I jump pews and run and squall and have myself time. Now my boys was giving me fit, and only one of them's in here now. They's giving me fit at lunch today. Said, "Dad, you're slowing down. We got out of church early today. What's going on with that?" I said, "Well, the whole time I started out preaching, and that little fellow in the back of my brain kept saying, slow down, slow down.' But I couldn't slow down this morning. I got to thinking about him. So I just couldn't slow down." I went as hard as I could as long as I could, but unfortunately I don't go as long as I used to because I'm getting worn out. It's not a question that I don't want to preach like I did as a young man. I just can't do it that way anymore because I'm getting old, huh? Because you all wasn't helping me. You help me, I can preach longer, huh? It's not a question of your effort. There's a lot of folks that want to do a lot of things and do a lot of things, but you can't do it like you once did. I appreciate the effort, even though you can't do it like you once did. This isn't a question of effort. It's not a question of your earnestness, of having a desire to sincerely do it for God. What a blessing. Matter of fact, if you're doing it around here and you're not doing it for God, you're not going to do it long because we're going to sit you down. Because around here, He gets the glory. It's always about Him. If you're doing it to be seen, we're not going to look at you long. We're going to sit you on down and put somebody there who wants to do it for the Lord's glory. This isn't a question about your ambition, that you want to see folks uh, get some help. You want to see Jesus get the glory for it. It's not a question about your ambition, not a question about how earnest you are to do this or the effort. And it's not even a question about the endeavor. You see the need to work, and you see the need of folks needing to get to Jesus, and you're aspiring to do anything to get folks to Christ. It's not a question about your endeavor. But if you're not careful, you can get worn out. Having the right effort, having the right ambitions, seeing the real need, you can get worn out. So when you're worn out, and you feel like you're heading to burnout, what should you do? What should you do? I don't know. There's some days. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's just us tonight. The kids aren't in here, so I can say things I wouldn't say when the kids are in here. All right? And I'll just be honest tonight. There are some days I want to live on an island. I told Miss Nette yesterday. I said, let's just go live on an island somewhere. She said, there's a problem. It's got to be a big island because our kids got to come. And number two, islands don't have electricity. They don't have Kroger's. They don't have, I said, we can live off love and live off the land, baby. We could eat fruit, either though neither one of us eat fruit. You know, we could eat fruit. And I said, we can kill chipmunks and eat them. She says, have at it. We ain't moving to no island, huh? But the reason I want to live the island is not because I want to eat chipmunks, because you don't have chipmunks on the island. You don't believe me? No, I was an and you got chipmunks? No, I didn't, I didn't think so, huh? You know, one of the things that I like about St. Lucia? Their island's not covered with lizards. You go to some of them islands, there's lizards. You know what a lizard is? It's a snake with feet. That's what it is, huh? 
There's one little spot on St. Lucie that has snakes, and there's nothing around there, nothing you want to see. And he said, and, and Nosh told me the other day, he said, oh, we got one little area that's got lizards. All right, so there's two areas. That's a beautiful island to go to. But the only problem is, if I go to that island, it's got the same problem we got in this place. People. People want to make you go to the island. Huh? You know, you deal with enough knuckleheads out there, you get fed up, and you say, boy, it'd be good to just go on an island and just sit there and talk to the Lord and tell Him how wonderful He is. But the only problem is God didn't save us to send us to an island. He saved us and put us in the midst of a cesspool so that can, people can see the Lord Jesus in our life. So when you start feeling like, boy, that island life is sounding real good. Listen to me. You know why Naj is here? Because the island life ain't as good as they make it look like on TV. Hmm? Huh? You know, when you see the pristine beaches and the wonderful, gorgeous water in the ocean, you think, hallelujah. Hmm? Matter of fact, the first time I was down there preaching at Ambassador Baptist Church, right behind the pulpit are these big, huge windows, and all you see is the ocean. I'm thinking, if this is the States, nobody's going to hear a word I'm saying. They're looking at the ocean. But see, they deal with the ocean all the time. No big deal to them. But what they don't show you and all them wonderful things on the Travel Channel and what Brother Sammy is doing, he takes you to the ghetto areas where people have nothing. And where those people have no hope. And the only thing down there that they face is a Catholic church still not giving them any hope. So island's life's not always what it's cracked up to be. But when you get worn out, and, feel, and start feeling like you're headed to burnout because it can happen you know I've heard people say oh Christian can't get burnout well you've not been one long enough uh, let me just help you some some days it, it's hard to read your Bible and pray and to walk right and talk right especially when they cut you off in this roundabout I don't want to talk right when they do I do talk right but I don't want to uh, my horn might not talk too right to them but I don't like it but there's some days It just gets a little overwhelming. So what do you do when it comes to that point? What can I say? First of all, you must wet the edge. Look at verse number 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, you've got to wet the edge. Now, as I was reading this the other day, it kind of just tickled me because uh, last week, uh, Brother Peter and Sister Dawn and Miss Annette and I, we went to dinner at this place, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a country restaurant right in the middle of Glendale, right outside of Indian Hill. And I'm thinking, what in the world is a country place doing here? But it, it is. It, it's like an old schoolhouse that they turned into a country restaurant, and they serve it just, uh, you know, old-fashioned time where they bring all the sides and fixings, and you just order whatever meat you want and all that. But there's a little general store right next to it, and we was waiting on the table, went to the general store, and what do you know? We get over there, and there's a whetstone, the old-fashioned kind on the wheel that you worked with your feet. I looked at Miss Nett. I said, you know what that is? She said, I have no idea. Look at Miss Dawn. You know what that is? I have no idea. Well, I'm thinking... These folks didn't grow up in the country. Huh? What's a wet stone? It was this round stone on a wheel that you'd put water on it, and you work it with your feet. Uh, uh, it's kind of like pedals, and it goes around in revolution. You take your blades, and you put on that uh, wet stone, uh, and you keep a good sharp edge on them. Uh, my dear friends, when you start headed to burnout, uh, uh, you start to get a little dull, start to get a little dim, start to get a little defeated. Uh, you must wet your edge. Uh, if you don't get that thing revived, if you don't get that thing uh, sharp again, uh, you're going to end up in trouble. You must wet your edge. Uh, how do you wet your edge? Well, thankfully, the Lord's given us the provisions to wet the edge. He's given us the scriptures. And Proverbs 27, 17 tells us, Iron sharpeneth iron. And what will sharpen you is the word of God. Uh, 
Uh, aren't you glad God gave us a book that tells us exactly what we need, when we need it, tells us what we're made of, and tells us why we're uh, not fit for the kingdom of God outside of the righteousness of Christ? Uh, and you get in here, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, the Lord will give you a precious psalm, or He'll give you a precious promise. Uh, he'll give you something uh, uh, that jump starts your heart again for Christ, uh, uh, that'll once again put a little uh, hitch in your giddy up, uh, uh, put a little. Uh, 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 a kick in your step uh, and once again you're ready to go another mile for Christ uh, he gives us the scriptures to wet the edge he also gives us the spirit of God John 14 or 4 14 but uh, whosoever drinketh of the water I shall give him shall never thirst uh, but the water I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life uh, uh, you can get around to, uh, the house of God and folks get to singing like what we heard tonight. Folks get to testifying. Uh, all of a sudden, the Spirit begins to bubble up in you. Uh, and even though uh, uh, you came in a little dull, you'll leave out uh, on fire for God. Uh, He'll also give you a song. I don't know how many times I've been out there just uh, feeling a little dull. All of a sudden, He'll give me a song. That'll stir my heart. Next thing I know, I'm skipping again. He'll give you something to wet your edge. You've got to wet your edge. Hmm? Uh, matter of fact, there's a, uh, Isaiah 61 3 talks about uh, uh, there's a song, uh, there's praise for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 35 10 talks about uh, 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 when Israel comes back after out of their captivity, that God's given them a song and He's given them oil of gladness and joy for mourning. Uh, my dear friends, a good song will help you down the road. You've got to wet the edge or you'll get burnt out. It's easy to, to happen. One of the things I appreciate about our sheriff, he's let these deputies know when they get to where they got a little burnout and need a day off, just let them know. They'll work it out. They'll get them a day off. Because they're putting their life on the line every day they put that uniform on. i got news for you. Every day you walk out into this world, you've got the uniform on of Christ and your life is on the line. Every day it's life or death. And when you feel like you're getting a little worn out, headed to burnout, you, you've got to wet the edge. I thought about this. You need to weigh the situation. Everybody has bad days. Everybody faces bad things. Everybody's subject to heartaches. Everybody's subject to Sickness, strength failing. Everything that happens to people in the world happens to you and I too. Just because you're saved don't mean that you have a life that is charmed and nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. I guarantee you something bad. The Bible said that they that uh, uh, shall live God, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You're going to face some hardness. Now, I, I, listen, I haven't known Brother Jack all his life because he's a lot older than me. But I will say this. When he got news about how bad his health was, he wasn't skipping and jumping and shouting saying glory. I know Brother Jack enough to know this because he and I are cut from the same cloth. He likes doctors about as much as I like doctors. But you made them doctor's appointments, didn't you? You had no choice. The only other choice was you was going to, the, to see my friend Chris Grubbs at the you know, funeral home, make your arrangements. Uh, listen, just because you're saved don't mean bad things don't happen. But you've got to weigh the situation. Yes, you may be having a bad day, and it may be the worst of days. Job said in Job chapter 3, the day of my greatest fear came upon me. It may be the thing that you dread the most may come into your life. But here's how you weigh the situation. You are saved. There are people out in the world getting the same news today. They're not saved. Uh, you know what will help you? When you realize, yes, this has befallen me, and this is a lot, but it didn't, cost, it didn't catch God by surprise. He is in control, uh, and if it came to me, it had to come through His hand. Uh, therefore, He esteemed it right for my life. It's part of His plan for my life part of his purpose for my life uh, and if God can trust me with it uh, I'll just bear this cross because uh, God has a reason for it uh, you got to weigh the situation 
And too many Christians, something goes bad, and you start sucking your thumb, thinking, oh, woe is me, God hates me. Hogwash, he loves you with an everlasting love. But why shouldn't something bad happen to you? Can I help you with something? There are people out there whose loved ones are dying tonight. There are people out there in the world who don't know Christ, uh, 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 who are facing jail time, who are facing uh, 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 losing their jobs, who are facing having to go to the gas pumps to pay the prices and all that kind of stuff. You know what I see? Every time I see one of them gas prices is on, on the signs when you drive by the gas, gas stations. Two things come to my mind. How unnecessary it is. We open up that pipeline that's going through the Midwest and that price of gas goes from $4 a gallon back there down to $1.75. And they'd be making money at $1.75. It, it irks me to know how unnecessary it is. But you know the second thing that comes through my mind? I belong to God. There's never been a time in my 48 years of being saved that I didn't hop in my car and need to go somewhere that didn't have gas in it. God's never failed me. And let me help you something, Brother Donald. He's not about to start failing me now. Amen. Hmm? He is God. See, you've got to weigh the situation. But there are people pulling into them gas pumps tonight that don't know if they'll be able to afford gas next week. Uh, Caleb Lindsay down there in camp meeting last week or two weeks ago said this, hey, the highest the gas price can go is nine ninety nine because they only got three digits on them things. <laughs> so what a blessing. And at nine ninety nine, God can still afford it. Mm. Uh. Now, what you don't know, or you've forgotten, but I hadn't forgotten, that back when Obama was in office, he made the statement that he wanted gas prices in America to line up with Europe. And at that time, Europe was paying about $8 a gallon. And if you get to feeling bad about how, how bad the gas prices are, have uh, Naj and Naren's dad tell you what they're paying for it on the island down there. It's, a, it's a, uh, uh, an island owned by the, the French or the English. They keep fighting over it. I don't know who owns it right now. But they got the European gas prices. They don't sell it by the gallon down there. They sell it by the liter. And they're paying more for a liter than we're ever dreaming about paying for a gallon. It's unbelievable. They're probably paying, I don't know, have they told you lately? They're probably paying around 11, 12 bucks for a liter. Because last time I was on the island, it was about 8 bucks for a liter. And I'm thinking, hallelujah, Brother Sammy's driving, not me. Huh? What I'm trying to say is when you start weighing the situation, you start looking around at what other people are facing and how good you've got it in Christ. All of a sudden, your uh, juniper tree starts uh, turning into palm leaves and you start praising the Lord for how good he is. It'll help you. When you get worn out, hit in the burnout. Can I say this? When you feel like you're getting worn out, hidden for burnout, and I know it happens. Listen, it happens to me. When you get to heading that way, you need to work wisely. Look at what verse 10 says again. I'm almost done. A couple of you about ready to faint. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength but wisdom is profitable to direct when you feel like you're getting worn out and you're headed to burn out well you can keep beating your brains to death you know what it's talking about it's taking a dull axe and hitting a stump and you keep hitting a stump and nothing's happening hmm? well you can keep wearing out that stump all you want to and nothing's going to happen or you can work wiser when you're beating your head up against the wall and nothing is happening. You know, the definition of his in insanity is doing the same thing the same way all the time and expecting different results. Hmm? Well, start working wiser. If you wait till the end of the night to do your devotion and your prayer, no wonder you had a bad day. The Bible says joy cometh in the morning. You get up early and pray and read before your day starts, and guess what? The Lord's going to be on your mind all day long. And it's going to help you have a better day. You've got to work wiser. You're still going to do some work. Still going to take some effort. But how you do your work will determine the outcome. You can work wiser. You can beat yourself to death. Or you can sharpen your edge. You can be a little wiser about this thing. 
If you know you're going to have to go through something, you're not going to like it, start getting a little better attitude before you start going through it. It'll help you. Hmm? And say, what if I don't want to get a better attitude? Then go find you a juniper tree. You're still going to have to go through it. You know what I found that the Lord does? He, he puts us through test. And much like school, if you fail the test, you've got to repeat the course, unless you're a good athlete. They'll just pass you on anyway, all right? But, but if, you, if, you, if you fail the test, you've got to do it again. Well, working wiser realizes if I don't pass this test, the Lord has me, and I'm going to have to do it again. I don't like doing it the first time, so uh, might as well do it right so I don't have to do it again. Hmm? It's kind of like the little boy. Mama says, go wash your hands, get ready for dinner. He comes uh, uh, down to, uh, to eat. She said, you wash your hands? Yeah, I do. Well, go wash them again. Use soap this time because his hands were nasty, huh? Well, sometimes uh, we have to go wash our hands again. It'd be easier just to work a little wiser so you don't have to go wash your hands again. Hmm? Now, some of you that was raised right and back in the day, if you didn't do what Mama said, that meant you had to deal with Daddy. Trust me, the next time Mama told you to do something, you did it with gladness, huh? But that's for another generation, I understand. And let me say this lastly. If you are getting worn out and you feel like you're heading to burnout, watch out. The Lord has put in all of us a mechanism called the Holy Ghost that warns us when trouble lies ahead. But when you get worn out and you're headed to burnout, you aren't listening to him very well. He speaks in a still, small voice, and a lot of times we drown him out because we know what he's going to tell us, and we don't want to hear that. We want somebody to pat us on the back and tell us we're doing great. And we want somebody to give us a license to do what we want to do instead of doing what God wants us to do. But when you are worn out, and you feel like burnout's coming, watch out. You say, watch out. Why? Well, you've got to watch out for danger. Because the devil is starting to lay some snares. You see, the wolf never attacks the sheep closest to the shepherd. He always gets the sheep that's farthest from the shepherd. And when you start getting worn out, you start dragging your feet a little bit, you're headed to burnout, guess what? You're getting farther and farther from the shepherd. And the wolf understands that. And that little sheep that's far from the shepherd, he don't realize there's a wolf in the tall grass. If he did, he'd get close to the shepherd. And when the wolf's got you in his clutches, it's too late to get to the shepherd. You've got to deal with the wolf. Watch out for danger. Thought about this. You get worn out, you're headed for burnout, watch out for distractions. Can I help you with something? The devil's got a Delilah for every Samson out there. Hmm? Had Samson listened to his parents, he'd never been down there messing with them Philistine women. Hmm? And can I say, when you start getting worn out, you start headed for burnout, there's some distractions out there. Might not be a Delilah, it might be overtime on the job. Might be a bass boat. Might be a new set of golf clubs. Might be a Corvette. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know what was so great about this week's weather? Didn't have to put the top up once. It was a wonderful week. Huh? Uh, I'm just trying to say there's distractions out there. There's nothing wrong with any of those things other than Delilah. As long as those things are in the right place. But when we get worn out, we tend to put things in the wrong order. And those things become distractions. Can I say, watch out for discouragement. You get worn out, you're a prime candidate to get discouraged. You know what the devil does when you're worn out? He, he, he just kind of puts a magnifying glass on everybody else's faults. Because when you get discouraged, it's because you're starting to find fault in everybody. That's how you know you're headed wrong direction. Let me help you something. Every one of us got faults. Every one of us got problems. Every one of us falls short of being perfect. We shall fall short of the grace of God. When you're right with God, you understand that. 
So you don't look for people's faults because, you know, the first place you'll have to look is the mirror. But when you start getting worn out, all of a sudden, all you start seeing, well, look at so-and-so, they're not doing anything. Look at so-and-so, they're not doing I'm doing everything, they're not doing anything. Why should I do everything when they're not doing anything? And all of a sudden, you're sitting there sucking your thumb. About ready to get burnt out. Hmm? Can I say this? Better watch out for despondency. The very, very litmus test for the fact that you're worn out is when you get to the point you don't want to do anything for God anymore. Well, I think I'm just going to sit down and do nothing anymore. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that works out for you. Mm -hmm. Get despondent. And I thought about this. You know, you're worn out, headed for burnout. You better watch out for discontentment. All of a sudden, you're no longer satisfied with the goodness of God. And you get your eyes on a far country like a prodigal. Well, it'd probably be better if I just take a few weeks off, me and my family go do this, and we just stay out there for a while. Let's enjoy what we've been missing. Mm -hmm. And you'll be out there for a long time. My mind right now is going to people that used to be faithful to the house of God. They haven't been in church in a long, long time because they got discontent. They got worn out, then they got burnt out, and they didn't watch out. And now they're just out. And that's where you'll be if you don't recognize what's going on. Preacher, why a message like this? Because that's where we live. I'd love to preach on heaven all the time. But the truth of the matter is, if you're not careful, you get burned out. And the Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. There are people watching your life. They want to know if it's real. And when you get worn out, and you end up burnt out, they'll say, nothing to it. And they'll go on in their life not trusting Christ. When you start feeling like you're getting worn out, ask the Lord to help you. He'll give you a, he'll give you a verse. The Spirit of God will help you. He'll give you a song. You get past worn out and you start getting burnt out, you really need to spend some time and ask the Lord to help you. Because if you're not careful, you just end up out altogether. The last thing that any of us ought to want to be is a statistic. Paul said, lest, you know, he said, lest I become a castaway when I preach to others. I don't want to preach to others and then me myself become shipwrecked. It can happen. It can happen to anybody. I've known some great men of God that are on the sideline tonight because they just got burnt out. When you get to that point, don't be afraid to cry for help, and the Lord will help you. Let's all stand tonight. Maybe tonight you just need to come, and Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Maybe tonight you just need to come and say, Lord, help me not to get burnt out. Maybe tonight you need to come and say, Lord, I'm tired. I'm just weary. Lord, I don't want to get worn out. Lord, help me tonight. Maybe you're past worn out. Maybe you're to that point where you're getting burnt out. Say, Lord, would you just give me a jolt of the Holy Ghost to help me get out of this funk that I'm in? Or maybe tonight he's put somebody on your heart that they're just out and you want to come pray for them. Maybe here tonight you don't know the Lord, but the Lord spoke to your heart through this, this unusual message that you need to get born again. Once you come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. The best life you can ever live is a Christian life. And boy, I'm glad we have a God that's promised to never leave us nor forsake us regardless of how worn out we get. Well, they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these in the altar. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for giving Solomon that wisdom. Because, Lord, these many years later, folks get weary in the flesh. So help us, Lord. Help us when we get worn out. Headed that juniper tree. God, step in. Help our lives. We want our lives to count for you. Now God bless in this invitation and certainly speak to hearts and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to what page. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.